Last time we talked about the fact that the apostles had been out with Jesus at his ascension. We, we dealt with that quite a bit and talked about the ones who were there. And We'll make another comment just in a few minutes when we get down to another uh, couple of verses. But I want us to begin in verse number 12 tonight. And we will talk about, uh, beginning there, several of the things that, uh, that uh, need to be talked about. Okay? Then they returned, they, referring to the apostles, the ones who had been with Jesus at his uh, ascension, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Let's talk about two or three things. We won't spend a whole lot of time there. But as we look at this, we, we first are called, our attention is called to the place where Jesus had ascended uh, to heaven from, where they returned from. And that place is called the Mount of Olivet here in this passage. Sometimes you'll look at it and see it in Scripture. It's simply called the Mount of Olives. And so as we look at that place, uh, it, it is said, of course, to be a Sabbath day's journey, which is somewhere around three-quarters of a mile. Uh, and so it's very near. It's not too awfully far from Jerusalem. I've never been there. But one day I would love to go over there and walk in the places where Jesus walked and see the things and the sights that are over there. But it's very near, the Mount of Olives is very near to the city of Jerusalem itself. Now, <clears throat> what I want to ask you tonight, it's just something that, uh, that uh, is one of those incidental things, but when you uh, talk about the Mount of Olives, what is out there at the Mount of Olives? Does anybody know what, what is at the Mount of Olives? Well, you would, you would think, you would understand, you would uh, probably figure that it's a place where there were olive groves, trees where there are, and so that is one thing. That's actually where it gets its name. But that's not really what it's known for, not even at the, day, the time of Jesus or, or today. Anybody know what is located at what is known as the Mount of Olives, what it, what it actually is. Anybody? Got a good guess? Try a cemetery. The Mount of Olives, the cemetery, the, the place out there, has been used as a cemetery for around 3,000 years, and there are over 150,000 burial places at the Mount of Olives. And so we don't normally think about that we think about the Mount of Olives it must have been a beautiful garden of some kind and I'm sure it was because of the trees that were there but we don't think about it being a cemetery and so Jesus in uh, going back and forth uh, as we'll notice here in just a second was spending some time out there now I'm pretty sure he wasn't calling folks out of the grave he could have said the word and all of them would have got up and walked out we know that because uh, uh, Lazarus did, and there were others that he raised from the dead. But Jesus would spend some time at the Mount of Olives, okay? What I want us to do, having that in mind, is let's go uh, and let's do some reading tonight, a few verses, a few passages. Look at Luke chapter 19 at verse number 29. And, and, and it's not like this place is just marked off as the cemetery. Uh, there were uh, passageways or roadways through it and so forth and so you can still uh, you can look up on the internet just type in Mount of Olives and you can find some pictures that are there but uh, look at Luke chapter 19 at verse number 29 and we want to see some of the things that relate to Jesus in the Mount of Olives okay or Mount called Olivet somebody got Luke 19 verse 29 Okay, so I just gave you one verse. Let me fill you in what's happening here. They are at the Mount of Olivet, or Mount of Olives, and Jesus sends two disciples, but what did he send two disciples to do? Well, this is when Jesus sends two of his disciples into the city of Jerusalem to go and to bring back the donkey that he would ride in on, the young colt that he would ride into the city of Jerusalem on. And this, he sent them from the Mount of Olives, okay? Look at another one, 
Uh, Luke chapter 21 at verse number 37. Luke 21 verse 37. Now for some folks this would sort of spasm out a little bit. Because I see some of you shaking your head. What happens there? Somebody read it. All right, now remember what I told you about the Mount of Olives? It's a cemetery, and so Jesus is going back out there camping out, camping out on the Mount of Olives. There's nothing for him to be afraid of, nothing for any of us to be afraid of for that matter. It's just sometimes a spooky thing for us when we start thinking about going out into a cemetery at night. But that's where Jesus spent some time, not only during the day, but he would spend some of his nights there as well. Look at Matthew chapter 24 at verse number 3. Matthew 24, verse number 3. All right, what's happening here? Jesus has made the statement as they're walking out of the city of Jerusalem that uh, the temple would be destroyed. And he has that discussion. And so when they get to the Mount of Olives, that's when the disciples begin to, to ask, what are you talking about? Can you give us some information about what you just said? But can you imagine them sitting at the Mount of Olives and looking up at Jerusalem and seeing the city itself? And remember that he said that the temple would be destroyed, not one stone would be left standing on another, and he would rebuild it in three days. And they thought it had to be the end of time that he deals with in Matthew chapter 24. And so he talks about at the first 35 verses, he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem beginning at verse 36. He talks about the end of, uh, or the second coming, if you will. And so uh, that's where they ask that question. They're sitting or they're with Jesus there at the Mount of Olives. Let's look at a couple more and then we'll, or at least one more. And then we will move on. Look at Matthew 26 at verse 30. Matthew 26 at verse 30. Whoever gets there, go ahead and read it out loud. Okay, so when is this? This is the night of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. It's the night that he would uh, be arrested. And so they go out to the Mount of Olives. Now, we know some of the other things that Jesus did while he was there. What did he do? It's there that he prayed. It's there that what, ha what would later happen. It's there that he would be arrested. He would be arrested there at the Mount of Olives. And so, you know, as you look at all of these things, there's a lot that's mentioned in the Word of God. And Jesus is associated with the Mount of Olives on a number of occasions, and it's from the Mount of Olives that Jesus ascended back into heaven. Now there's some strange ideas. If you get online and you start uh, doing some reading in regard to Jesus and the Sabbath day's journey and all of the things that, that are there, there's some strange ideas that people present uh, in regard to that. But uh, it's just, you know, it's fascinating to me that Jesus would spend time in this place and it's here that he would be arrested and it's here that he would go back and ascend back to heaven, back to his Father. And so that's the Mount of Olives. That's where they had been. That's where they went. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Verse 13, and when they had entered, they went up to the upper room and were uh, where they were staying. And then he gives us Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. Okay? And so we have, we have a list of the 11 apostles. Um, let's go back to the beginning of that verse. And when they had entered, that is, they entered back into the city of Jerusalem, they went to the where? went to the upper room. Now, it's interesting to me that in the original language and here in the English Standard as well, the definite article is used, they went to the 
upper room. Went to the, what upper room are they talking about? Well, it seems that uh, Luke probably has a specific upper room in mind, okay? But look at Luke chapter 22, verse number 12. Luke chapter 22, verse number 12. Okay, so Jesus sends two of his uh, apostles into the city of Jerusalem to get the donkey, but also to do what? To make ready a place for them to observe the Passover. Where were they going to do that? The upper room. What does he mean, the upper room? Well, in, in those days, and I'm told in the old city of Jerusalem still today, most of the residences had more than one floor. They had an upper, I mean a lower and an up. They had an upstairs, we'll just put it that way. And so there was a large upper room, Luke tells us, and that's where Jesus and his apostles observed the Passover. That's where Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper. And it seems to me that what Luke is alluding to, since he uses the definite article and he's the one who tells us about the upper room, in Luke chapter 22, that probably what has happened is the apostles from the time that Jesus has been um, uh, crucified, you know, from that night, it seems that they've sort of made that home base, that they were still using that location, that place, and so may even have, well, actually, he does say there, they went to the upper room where they were staying, where they were residing, and so it may well be that it's this same place that uh, Luke has in mind. And, and again, it may not be that that is definite for certain. Some of, the, some of the commentaries that you read, you know, would call that into question. But it seems to me to make sense, and, and many of the reliable commentators that I saw, that I read, it makes sense to them that Luke is talking very likely about that same place that they had been on the night. And so they had been there. Now how long, how long had they been making that perhaps home base? At this point when they go back, how long had it been since Jesus had uh, been crucified and resurrected? That's earlier in the chapter. How many days? He spent how many days with them? Forty days with them. And so... Perhaps they've been there for a little over a month now, making that their home base, okay? And so they had entered, uh, they, they went into that upper room, these 12 or 11 men are mentioned here in this particular place, and so uh, this is perhaps, again, home base for them. Now let's look at verse 14, verse 14. Billy, could you click me up there for some reason? We're not, we're not going. Verse number 14 says, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now who are all these? Well, it's the 12 men or 11 men rather. I keep going back to the, to the, to the 12, but it's actually the 11 men that are mentioned in verse number 13 that, uh, that Luke says all these, but he says all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with some other folks. Now, uh, who were the others who were present? Who were the others who were present? Well, number one, Luke says, the women. Who is Luke talking about when he mentions the women? Let's look at a couple of passages, uh, again, from the pen of Luke that may give us some insight as to who the women that he's talking about here in uh, uh, verse 14, who they actually are. Go to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Who wants to read? Read. 
Okay, so we've got some women who are traveling with him and with the 12 apostles. One of them specifically named here is Mary Magdalene, and he says there are others whom he had cast out demons from. But number one of them may well have been Mary Magdalene. Now, does Mary play a part in, in anything else? Yes. Go to, again, the book of Luke chapter 24 and look at verse number 10. Luke chapter 24, verse number 10. And what's happening here in Luke chapter 24, verse 10? We're at the end of the book of Luke, so we ought to be able to figure that out, what's happening here. Resurrection and all of the events that began to take place after that. So what happens here in this passage? Somebody read verse 10. Okay, so what things about the resurrection, about what Jesus had uh, said to them, if you read the entire context there. So we've got Mary Magdalene, who's been mentioned as one of the women who traveled with Jesus back in uh, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And now we've got, according to Luke, the same writer that we're reading here in Acts, we've got some other women who are mentioned. And who are they? Well, we've got a list of women, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and simply called the other women. Some will never know their names. We may be able to ask in heaven one day, but we don't know their names. But very likely what, again, Luke is uh, alluding to when he talks about the women is Mary Magdalene. Mary had gone out with these other women to, uh, to, to put the spices on the body of Jesus. You know, they had gone out very early on that Sunday morning and found the tomb rolled away, and it was Mary to whom Jesus appeared first. And so you would expect if there's any women who are going to be staying with the apostles and, you know, would have been with him after his resurrection, these would have been among them. And so we've got very likely some of these same women that are mentioned earlier in the book of Luke uh, that are still together with them here at uh, Jerusalem. Okay, so we've got the women, and then we've got who else? Well, before we get to the brothers, we've got Mary, the mother of Jesus. When, uh, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, and, and he looked down, and he saw his mother standing there, who was the, other, who was the only apostle who was standing nearby? John, and what did he say? One of the seven sayings that Jesus spoke from the cross, Behold your mother. Jesus is, is commending John or putting the, uh, maybe the responsibility, if you will, uh, on John to make sure that his mother is cared for. Now, we don't know how long that lasted because... What do we read next? We've got not only Mary, the mother of Jesus, but who else? Brother Eddie said it, jumped ahead there a second ago. And his brothers. Now why is that significant? What about the brothers? Look at uh, John 7, verse 5. John 7, verse 5. Yeah, for not even his brothers, I'll quote it for you, for not even his brothers believed in him. Now, who were, who were Jesus' brothers? We have the names of some of his brothers, or probably all of his brothers, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, where the people ask, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James? And Joseph, and Simon, and Judas. I'm sorry? Uh-huh. you got there, and you've got here in Matthew as well, chapter 13, verse 55, but you've got, you've got the names. James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas. Now, whether there were all four there or not, 
We don't know. There was more than one of them who was there. But what made the difference? What changed their minds? What do you think changed the minds of these brothers? Now, I don't know for certain, but I want you to go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at verse number 7. Y'all remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about the appearances of Jesus to the different ones? We spent a lot of time going through that list. And, and this is one of, the, one of the ones that we looked at in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 7. Who is one of the specific people that Jesus is said to have made an appearance to? Which James? Which James? We've got James, an apostle, don't we? We've got James, the brother of Jesus, don't we? Okay. Which one of those came, became one of the most prominent men in the church? The brother? You mean James, the apostle, was not the most prominent James? Let's look at a couple of passages. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 2. Acts chapter 12, verse 2. Let's build us a case right here. Okay, so somebody got killed. Who was it? What James is that? James the apostle. Who, who did the killing or had him killed? Herod. Okay. And so James dies. James the Apostle dies. Okay, Stay in the same chapter in uh, Acts chapter 12 and look down to verse 17. Which James? Not the dead James. <laughs> James, the brother of Jesus. So Peter, after he, after he miraculously escapes from prison, after he's released by the angel, he goes back to the house, knocks on the door. The first, the girl, you know, she sees Peter standing out there and turns around and runs. She won't let him in. She, you know, finally he gets in. He says, I want you to go and tell James. Okay? Now, Paul has already said Jesus appeared to James, okay? Peter says, go tell James. James is pretty prominent, isn't he? Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. Paul is recounting his uh, beginning of his preaching, I guess you might say, and, and, and his acceptance in, as a Christian among the, the brotherhood. Okay, Galatians 2, verse 9. Okay, which James? Now we know who Cephas is, that's Peter. We know who John is, that's the John the Apostle, which James? Do what? Not the dead one. <laughs> okay, so, so when, did P, when did Paul go up and talk to James and, when, and, and Peter, and when did they accept him? Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 13. Acts chapter 15, verse 13. This is what's commonly called the Jerusalem Conference. Barnabas and Paul go and they talk to the elders the apostles at Jerusalem. After they were finished speaking, this is Peter and, I mean, uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas. After they had finished speaking, who spoke up? Not the dead one. Which James? The most prominent one in the church at that time, especially in Jerusalem. And so... James, Jesus appears to him. Can you imagine the conversation they must have had? Jesus 
half-brother who had not believed in him. And now he's alive after having been crucified. The resurrection, I believe, made the difference in whether Jesus' brothers would have been there in Jerusalem or where they had stayed away. They had become believers because of his resurrection. You know what? That's really the same thing that all of us should base our faith on, isn't it? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's just interesting to me, you know, this, we're just reading through the book of Acts. And, and the Bible just casually says that, well, now, when the apostles came back to Jerusalem from his ascension, we had the women who were there, and we had Mary who were there, and we had Jesus' brothers who were there. And, and then we are able, with what we have elsewhere in scriptures, able to come to a conclusion that the resurrection itself likely had something to do with their newfound faith. Okay? So, those are the ones who are there. All right, let's go on to verse number 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. Oh, wait a minute. About to miss part of verse 14. I can't miss, I can't miss that part. Okay? Let's go back to the first part of verse 14. Okay? Talked about the, the ones who were there. But he says about the ones who were there that they with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. With one accord. What does it mean with one accord? Now before anybody speaks up and says it just simply means that they all drove Hondas. The Honda Accord. What does it mean one accord? Same mind, okay. One mind could literally mean unanimously. All of them together, unanimously. Now, look at a couple of uh, passages where the same word is used. Acts chapter 2, verse 46, just want to make a point. What were they doing? Now, they were together with one accord and were the, devoting themselves to prayer. But in Acts chapter 2, after the church has been established, and we've got the first insight into the first days of the church, what happens? What do we find out about those disciples who had been baptized on the day of Pentecost and those who were subsequent to them? Verse 40, 40, uh, uh, six, Acts 2.46. Day by day, they did what? Oh, they attended the temple. Same word. Same word that's a tra uh, translated one accord. They, attend, they were unanimously, they were of one mind in going to the temple. Okay? Look at another one. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 57. Again, just a, a little insight. Acts chapter 7, verse 57, we have, this is the story of Stephen, as he is about to be stoned to death. What does it say about the people who were about to stone Stephen to death? They rushed together. Same word. Here's a unison, a, a, an almost unanimous thing where everybody is working in harmony they're working as Matt, uh, Mike said a while ago they're of one mind okay and so thinking about that looking back at Acts chapter 2 verse 46 that we read just a second ago it seems like the church was pretty unified especially there at the beginning doesn't it they, they going to the temple uh, why would they do that because they wanted to worship as a Jew? Why would they go to the temple every day? That's where the people were. What do you think they were doing? Seeking to make other disciples? I think that might be the case. So, we've got them with one accord, and they're devoting themselves. What does it mean to devote oneself to something? 
The word devoting means to be earnest toward, to persevere, to be constantly diligent. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. You don't even have to turn over there. Somebody quote it. All at one time. The English Standard says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. What are these things that are mentioned here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42? Four of five actions that we participate in when we worship. The only one that's not mentioned there is singing, but they're, they're mentioned there. But what did, what did the early Christians do? Same thing that Peter and Andrew and James and John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and James, the brother of Jesus. Same thing they were doing on those 10 days between the time that Jesus ascended and the time that the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles and they began to preach the gospel. They devoted themselves to prayer. We are to devote ourselves to the worship. Acts 6 verse 4, we're going to run out of time. Acts 6 verse 4, the Bible says there, this is the apostles speaking, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's when they were having the difficulties with the Grecian widows and they had mentioned that they were to choose seven men who were to serve the tables because the apostles had other things that they needed to do. And what was it that they were doing? They were devoting themselves to the prayers and to the preaching and so forth. Look at Mark 3, verse 9. I just had to throw this one in because, <clears throat> just because. Acts, uh, or rather, Mark chapter 3, verse 9. Just to see the diversity of the word. Okay. A small boat should be kept ready. Uh, English Standard says to have a boat ready. That's the same word. Jesus told them on this, this, on this particular occasion, I want you to have me a boat that is devoted to me. Nobody else is going to be on it because I've got to make a getaway because the people may crush me. You know, they, Not that they're mad at him. They're wanting to hear him and they're wanting to... Uh, him to heal them and all of those things. And so, you know, that, that's a, that, that boat was solely for who? That boat that was devoted was solely for Jesus and his apostles, the one who were going with him. So, who, if we're devoted to Jesus, if we're devoting ourselves to prayer, if we're devoting ourselves to the teaching and the, the preaching and the giving and so forth that we read about in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 42. You know, there's that, there's, that's what, we're not occupied or preoccupied by other things. Those are the things that are first and foremost. Okay? Now, one other thing, and, and uh, it's time for uh, our bell to, to ring, but one more thing. It seems, you know, if you read that, just a casual reading of it that they were doing all of that for these 10 days in the upper room. Am, am I misreading that there? You know, it, it, at least the implication uh, to some would be that, you know, they've come together in this upper room and they've just, they're just staying there praying. Well, I will assure you that's not the case because the same writer tells us more details in his first book. The book of Luke. Go back real quick tonight to Luke chapter 24, verses 52 and 53. Luke 24, 52 and 53. Okay, so where were they doing their praying and all of these things, the devoting of themselves to prayer? They were continually in the temple doing that, not stuck in the upper room for 10 days. 
And so they, uh, Luke, Luke gives us that detail in his first book. Now, remember last week I mentioned in connection with the ascension that there was a, a distinction made in the apostles and those who awaited them in Jerusalem? I think that's what we have here is uh, found in verses uh, 12, 13, and 14. Not that, that all of them were there, but that the apostles were there, all these men, you men of Galilee that we talked about last time. So we've got, we've got all of that. And, and, and I said we would mention that, and I don't have time to deal with it, elaborate on it, but that's where you know, this section that we just finished with tonight is where we get most likely that only the apostles, the 11, were the ones who witnessed the ascension. They were the ones... and doing the miraculous thing. All right. 